I want to take this moment in time to welcome our dear friends from Sacramento, around the Sacramento area, California. They flew out this weekend, this high Sabbath weekend, to be with us. Pastor Mo and his family, Micaiah and Amari, the young child, we're so grateful to have them enter our church and share God's word with us. And a little bit about Mo first. So Mawethu Zonki goes by Mo, Pastor Mo. I've always known him as Pastor Mo, my friend. I was deployed to Korea in uh, 2016 with my family, and we were looking for a church. And many of you don't know Candice, but Candice used to go to our church. Candice and Michael, they used to go to our church. And we saw online that there was a small church that recently became a bilingual church, English, Korean, a Seventh-day Adventist church, a beacon of hope in this big, bustling city in Korea. So we went there, and Pastor Mo was the pastor. And the fascinating thing about this was that he was so inviting to uh, for us, our families, and um, the service members that came to Korea, other Adventists, they were looking for a place to, to fellowship, and and Mo would go out on the streets and hand out tracts. Do you remember handing out tracts, if you guys ever done that before? But in interfacing with people you don't know, strangers, every single day, you know, and trying to get the word out. Mo is from South Africa. He moved to Korea, left his hometown to share the gospel of Christ. And if you remember the message from the Babel, the, the um, Sabbath school study this, this week, was that God wants us to go out into all the world and cover the land and share the gospel. And he took that message to heart. And I'm so glad that we're just lucky to have him here, that he was actually back in the United States to be with his family, start his family in California, because that's where his wife's from. And so he took some time to, to fellowship with us. And so I just wanted to welcome him to our church. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Good Try that again. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. God is good. Good morning. And all the time. Do we do we believe that? Yes. I um I want to mention this first. At first, I want to thank Craig for the um, generous introduction, and I. Also grateful for the special song that is very much fitting to um, my message this morning. I want to mention that Jesus is the one who left the throne for the manger. He's the one who left the crown for the cross. He's the one who died and resurrected for us. He's the one who is in heaven right now ministering as a priest for us. And therefore, I believe that Jesus is the only one qualified to speak to us this morning. It is Jesus who's qualified to deal with the issues of salvation and speak to us life, the words of life. He's the only one who's qualified. So I feel unworthy this morning to speak to you. But I'm also grateful for the privilege that God has given me to share a word with you. And so I want us to bow together for prayer before I um, continue to share with you. And Jesus, I come before your throne this morning. I, I understand that I am unworthy of this sacred duty. And so I come to you and ask that you may touch my heart and forgive me of my sins and touch this feeble form of clay and sanctify it for your glory. May I decrease and be hidden behind the cross as you increase and are glorified in this place. I ask for your spirit on this pulpit, your spirit in my heart, your spirit in everybody's heart right now in this place. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. amen. I want us to take our Bibles this morning and go together to the text that was read to us this morning, which is Luke 11, and I want to read with you um, verse 1 through verse 4. Luke 11, let me check the technology and make sure that 
I am ready. I'll turn this on. Can this be off? Okay. Luke 11, verse 1 through verse 4. Are we there? Amen? I am reading uh, from the new um, King James version of the Bible. It says, now it came to pass as he was um, praying in a certain place that when he assisted, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for uh, as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. May God bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know what your favorite Bible story is. I don't know your favorite Bible character, or your favorite book of the Bible, or even your favorite Bible text. But I want to recommend Jesus to you this morning in all these categories. I know that I have met people who come and say, it's very difficult to read the Bible. I'm trying, but I don't know where to start. And my response every time is, start with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I know that some of you may recommend differently. But I want to tell you that I have a very strong feeling that if anyone wants to understand God, they have to study the life of Christ. So I believe that's the right place to start when you want to understand God, the Gospels. And sometimes when I read the Bible, I don't know about you because I, I get excited when I read my Bible. I, I'm just happy to read the Bible. It, it connects me to, with, with God and it's so special to me. Sometimes when I read, I insert myself in the stories just to feel the impact. Can you imagine how it felt to be there when Jesus was saying to this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, when Jesus said to her, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. How did that feel to her? I, I, I don't know how it felt to be there in Bethany. When Jesus was calling Lazarus back from death to life, I, I, I can imagine the frenzy, the excitement, the joy, the confusion even, as Jesus spoke life to Lazarus. I, I don't know how it felt to, to, to be in the audience as, as Jesus was teaching the crowds by the wayside or, 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 or up the mount or even from the boat, how did it feel to be there, to listen to the master as he taught? The Bible tells us that sometimes Jesus would go to a city or a village and heal everyone who was sick. Did I say everyone? Everyone who was sick. And how did it feel to be there and be part of his entourage? I want us this morning, for the sake of our sermon, to imagine together Jesus in prayer. And for our story this morning, from the text we just read, we, we get the picture that his disciples had momentarily left him. And, and, and when they came back, they found him praying. And as if he was oblivious to their presence, he continued to pray out loud and they watched and listened as the son communed with the father. And when he was done, only one thing was on everybody's mind. I want to pray like that. And, and the request was made. Lord, teach us 
to pray. I want to remind you this morning that the disciples were Jewish, meaning this was not the first time for them to hear somebody pray. There was prayer in every Jewish household twice a day at least. And there was prayer in the temple and there was prayer in every synagogue. And the, the Pharisees had a habit of praying publicly on street corners and in the marketplace. And the disciples themselves had learned to pray in their childhood when they learned from the rabbin, rabbinical schools. They knew how to pray. They must have memorized the famous Jewish prayers. They knew how to pray. But there must have been something different about how Jesus prayed that inspired this request. And I suspect it was not just the words that affected them. I think it was the intimacy, the, the, the earnestness, even the fervor with which Jesus prayed that moved them to ask them to, him to teach them how to pray. I now wonder how Jesus felt when he heard this request and, and, and what did they expect from him? I suspect they expected something complicated. But he gives them the Lord's Prayer and he's repeating it because he had said it before uh, on his sermon on the mount. He repeats it. And I, this morning, have no intentions to give a breakdown analysis of the Lord's Prayer. I have two things to say about the, the Lord's Prayer as a way of commentary. Um, one, glaring observation when we read the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, and Luke, as we just read. There's one observation you can make and if you read that. It's simple that prayer does not have to be complicated. It does not have to be long worded or even big worded. It can be simple, precise, to the point, and the Lord will still listen to it and answer it. That's the first part of the Lord's Prayer. Now, this morning, I want to mention four things that I think of as fundamental to prayer. Four things that I think we should always remember every time we pray. And the first thing that I want to mention is part of the Lord's Prayer. The opening line of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven. Now, I want you to notice with me that Jesus could have said, when you pray, you could say, our king who is in heaven, or our creator who is in heaven, our master, our Lord, our God, even our savior. But he chose to say, our father who is in heaven. In heaven. I want to tell you that Jesus was always intentional in everything he did, including his words. He said, Our Father who is in heaven. So, the first fundamental, the first thing that Jesus thinks is important for us to understand when we pray is that God is our Father. Now, he says, When you approach his throne, to make your petitions known. When you kneel down to unburden yourself to him. When you open your mouth to confess your sins to him. When you share with him the desires of your heart. Remember, he is your father. Now, I was looking at this and, and I, I, I observed that in the gospels, Jesus emphasized this, the fatherhood of God, many times. In fact, I had counted over 20 times in Matthew, Mark, and John alone. Did not include, uh, in Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke alone, 
20 times, Jesus is emphasizing time and time again, God is your father. God is your father. When you think of it, when you, when you look at um, Matthew 5, 16, he says, um, uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that they may glorify your father who is in heaven. And then he says, um, you, when you pray, go into your room and pray to your father who's in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you in public. That's Matthew 6 verse 6. And then he says, um, think of the birds of the, of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into, into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. And then he asked the question, are you not more valuable than they? And then he says, um, he says, now therefore, do not say, watch, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or drink or wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, but your Father in heaven knows that you need all these things. That's Matthew 6 verse 31 and 32. And then he says, be merciful as your Father is merciful. It's Luke 6, 6. And he says, um, my favorite one, the beautiful one, and I want you to go back and read it, is in, is in um, Luke chapter 12, verse 32. He says, now do not fear, O little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's Luke 12, verse 32. So he says this uh, time and time and time again, and I was thinking, why does Jesus think he should emphasize this. The Father, and I, I mentioned to you that Jesus was always intentional in everything he did, including his words. Why did he keep reminding us time and time and again, God is your Father. Think of him as your Father. He is your Father. When you come to him in prayer, remember, he is your Father. I found this statement um, in, um, I think it's not, I hope it's clear for you, it's not clear for me. Um, in um, Christ's Object Lesson 141, in order to strengthen our confidence in God, Christ teaches us to address him by a new name, a name entwined with the dearest association of the human heart. He gives us the privilege of calling the infinite God our Father. The point is, Jesus is emphasizing this to strengthen our confidence in God and our confidence in our prayers. He says, call him your father, call him your father. That would strengthen your confidence in him. And the last portion talks about it is sweet music to his ear when God hears us pray to him and call him father. I cannot read the screen, but I know what it says. It is music to him, to hear us come to him and think of him and pray to him as he is the father. Now, I must mention that the name or the word father is not always associated with positive things because we live in such a corrupt world, in an evil world. And Jesus was quite aware of that. And so when you look at... Um, John 17, the prayer, he talks about him in verse 11 as Holy Father. In verse 25, he says, Righteous Father. In Matthew 7, 11, he compares God, our Father, to us and our parenting. He says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? But the best text about God's fatherhood that I appreciate is and so clear, so precise. The Father himself loves you. So our God 
is a loving father. He is compassionate and tender-hearted. He is gracious and merciful. He is giving and forgiving. And Jesus says, that's the first thing I want you to think of before you approach his throne. Remember, he's your father and he's compassionate. He loves you. First thing, first fundamental to prayer. When you approach his throne, Jesus, remember him as your father. Now the second point, the second fundamental can only be appreciated as we understand the first. And it's simple. Remember, God is wise. Remember, God is wise. I, I was thinking of these beautiful verses uh, in the book of John, they're mostly in the book of John, where Jesus says, uh, um, ask whatever, whatever you ask in my name, I will give it to you. That is um, John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. He says, ask anything in my name and I will do it for you. He says, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Ask in my name and I will give it to you. Another verse, uh, another text is um, John 16, 23 and 24. He says the same thing. If you ask, the, he says, verily I say unto you, if you ask the Father of anything in my name, he will give it to you. He says, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. He says, ask that you may receive and that your joy may be full. Ask in my name. Now, I was thinking of these beautiful verses, and there are many others like this, and they're mostly in the book of John. Ask in my name, and it will be done for you. Another text says that if you ask and you believe, then you will receive. These are good verses, and I love them. Powerful verses if you ponder them. I was thinking to myself though, um, I was thinking about all these times I prayed in Jesus' name and believing that he will do something for me and I was waiting in expectation of his gift and it never came. I prayed in his name, I prayed believing. And by the way, before I go further with that, I just want you to Understand, I, for those who don't understand what it means to pray in Jesus' name, I want you to think of yourself as someone who has really ba bad credit, very bad credit score, because that is true. Because of our sinfulness, we have no credit with the Father. But what does he say when he speaks of his son? He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus says, unlimited credit with the father. And he says, because you have a relationship with me, then I'll give you a credit card, as it were, in my name. And you can pray in my name. And God the father will hear you and give whatever you ask in my name. He gives us his credit. Pray in my name. Ask anything in my name. That's what it means to pray in his name. So I'm going back to the verses now that I mentioned. That are good verses. Whatever you ask in my name, the Father will do for you. And I was thinking about all these times, like I mentioned, that I prayed and I did not receive what I prayed for. Then I found this text that I want us to read together, which is 1 John 5. 1 John 5. And I want us to read verse 14 and 15. Are we there? Amen? It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked for. Now that, that makes sense to me. If you ask anything according to his will, then he will hear you. And if he hears you, we know that you have the petitions you've asked for. If you ask according to his will, and I know for myself, I, I don't know for you, 
that sometimes my will is not in harmony with his will. I know that. I, I'm sure you guys are good Christians and so it's different for you. But for, for my experience, I know that sometimes my will is not in harmony with his will. And he says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. It's different. And I want you to combine that uh, text with this one in, um, in, in Psalm 84 verse 11. He says, I'm just reading the last part. He says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That means if it's good for you, God will give it to you. Are you understanding this? If it's good for you, then God is going to give it to you. The question though is, between God and us, who decides what's good? Between God and us, who decides what's good? And the Bible says about us, there's a way that seems right in the eyes of men, but its ends are of destruction and death. That means we don't always know what's good for us. That means sometimes the things that we think are good for us lead us to a path of destruction. The things that we sometimes think are bad for us sometimes turn out to be good for us. And sometimes the things we wish to avoid happen to be the things we need, the very things we need in order for us to grow. And God is wise. He's wiser than us. When we pray, he knows the things we don't know. He sees where we cannot see. And he answers in his wisdom. This text, um, this um, statement from uh, Steps of Christ, 96. That wonderful chapter, the privilege of prayer. It says, God is too wise to err. And too good to withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly. God is too wise to err. And too good to deprive you the thing that would be good for you. And I, I mention this because if we understand it, if we understand, if our minds can grasp that, then we thank God for the doors he's closed as well as for those he's opened. If we understand God is wise, we will thank him when he says no, as well as when he says yes. We will praise him on our, in our valleys as well as our, on our mountaintops. We will praise God because we understand God is is wise. Now, the third point I want to make, um, in fact, before I go to the third point, is that I, I wish we could appreciate this wisdom of God and, and understand it. Because sometimes we are very unhappy with God when he does not give us the things we ask for because we think there's, there's, there's a misunderstanding, there's something wrong. We should always trust his wisdom as well as we trust his love. Trust his wisdom in our lives. And I'm telling you right now, if you pray for something and you get it, you receive it, and it's not from God, it is not a blessing to you, but a curse. If God is not in it, then you don't want it. You don't want it. If you, you got something, whatever you were wishing for and praying for, somehow it, it, it was given to you, but not from God. You don't want that. You don't want that. So we, we allow God as we trust him to decide what's good for us. There was a, a poem that was written in 1869 that became a very famous um, Methodist hymn. Um, I, 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 the, the last stanza of this poem, the, the title of the poem is Not Knowing. It, was, it became a, a, a hymn uh, in 1879, a Methodist hymn. The title is Not Knowing. It's, it's a beautiful poem, I read it. This person, um, Mary Gardiner, says, I would rather walk in the dark with God 
than to go alone in the light. I would rather walk with him by faith than to walk alone by sight. And I repeat, if God is not in it, you don't want it. If you are with him in the dark, you are safe. Than without him in the light. So God is wise. Remember that uh, the second point, the third point, which I want to make, is that God is all-powerful. I I said I had four points. This is the second last point. God is all-powerful. You know why? why? Why do I think this is important for us to remember? Because if we understand that, then we will not be afraid to pray for big things. If we understand God is powerful, then we will not be afraid to pray for big things. And in in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, he says, Behold, I am God, the Lord, uh, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Uh, It seems like a challenge. God is challenging us. He says, What is it that you think I cannot do? What is it that you want to pray for, but you are reluctant to pray because somehow in your mind you think I cannot do? What is it? Is there anything too hard for me? And, 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 the, and the angel Gabriel is putting it in, in a very positive way. He says, for with God nothing will be impossible. Now, the statement, Christ's object lesson 146 He longs to have you reach after him by faith. He longs to have you expect great things from God. God wants us to expect great things. He wants us to pray big prayers. And I I, I wish we could understand that God, there's no limitations with him. He is boundless. There's nothing that would be impossible for him. And he wants us to pray big things. For big things. And, 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 and Joshua understood this. Joshua understood this and, and he prayed for the sun to stand still and it, and it did. Elijah understood this and, and he prayed that there would be no rain and there was no rain for three and a half years. And Elisha prayed the same prayer for a son, the widow's son who was dead. For him to come back from death to life and he was revived. And because of Daniel's prayer, God closed or locked the jaws of the lions. Now, I want to challenge you this morning. Please, pause. Just think with me. Pause. I need you to think right now with me. I'm challenging you now. Think of the greatest thing, the biggest thing you've ever wished for. And I'm sure everybody has that. Think of it, whatever it is. Pause right now. Think of it. Let it come to mind. What is it that you've dreamed for? Uh, what, what is it that is the biggest thing you can think of that you've ever wished for? What is it? Now, the second question is, what is the greatest prayer you've ever prayed? Are these two the same thing? Are they the same thing? Whatever that's big that you wish for, and whatever you've prayed for, the biggest you've prayed for, are they the same thing? I ask you, what is it that you think God cannot do for you? What is it that you, you are reluctant to talk to God about? What is it that you, you think is impossible for God to do? Think of it. Now, the last part of my sermon is this. Uh, before I go to the last part, I want to recap the three points that I made. One, I want you, according to Jesus and the, uh, what, the, whatever I've been saying up, up, up until this point. One, when you pray, remember God's love for you. That wants what's best for you. He wants what's best for you. Because he loves you. He's your father, remember. Number two, do you remember the wisdom of God that knows what's best for you? And number three, do you remember the power of God that can accomplish 
what's best for you. The last thing I want to mention is that prayer is not transactional, but relational. This is the last thing I want to say. Prayer is not transactional, it is relational. I, I say this because sadly, we have reduced prayer to an ask and give, give and take, bless and be blessed, exercised, uh, exercise. That's, that's what we think of prayer. And, and, and some have reduced God to a vending machine of blessings. There's no personal relationship. Nothing personal. You go there, no relationship. You go to God and get what you want and walk away. And I want to tell you that prayer is much bigger than that. Prayer is a tool that God put in place for us to be able to have a relationship with him. It's not about the give and take and bless and be blessed. It's for us to have a relationship with, with God. Now, I, I want you to think of this in, in case you don't understand what I'm saying. This um, transactional mindset to prayer. One statement that make, uh, is very popular. You've, have you seen this before? Pray until something happens. Have you all seen this? It's a, it's a, it's a transactional way of thinking about prayer. And, and I know that it's been said on the pulpit by some SDA pastors and, and good preachers and everybody, maybe in some literature that we have. Pray. It's called push, right? Pray until something happens. I'm telling you, that's a transactional way of thinking about prayer. And I'm saying, this is dangerous. Why? Because it implies that nothing is happening. Nothing happens unless you can see it. Number two, it implies that nothing is happening. Nothing happens until you receive what you pray for. If you haven't received what you pray for, then nothing happened. Everything else, every, every time you pray is an exercise in futility. You can pray ten times and, and nothing happens. And, and by the time you, maybe you get to the tenth time you receive the gift, all the other nine times you pray don't count. Because nothing happened. Because you couldn't see what had happened. You understand this? It's a dangerous way. It's a transactional way of thinking about prayer. Now, I want to take you to this statement that we all know. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. You know this? Not that it is necessary in order to make um, known to God what we are, but in order to enab enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. I want you to understand this. That prayer um, does, like the statement says, every time we pray, we're not telling God something that he, that he doesn't already know. He already knows what we need before we pray. And, and in fact, if you think about it, most of the blessings that you have were not prayed for. God knew the need. He, he saw your need and just blessed you for your sake. Nobody prays for the air we breathe. Most people don't. I'm sure some people do, but I know most people don't, and that's one of the greatest blessings we have. And God knew we need air, and he blessed us. But this statement says that prayer, it makes us able to receive not just the things we pray for, but God himself. And I want you to get that. Please don't miss that. Prayer enables us to receive God himself that means if you prayed for a job, if you, if you were jobless and you, you're praying for a job and you did not receive the job, but instead you received God in your life, you receive, you've received the biggest thing, the greatest need you have, God. If you received God and you didn't receive the job you're praying for, your prayer was answered. In fact, you received the greatest blessing ever. On the other hand, if you prayed to God for a job, and, and all you received in your prayer, all you got 
was the job and you did not receive God together with the job. There's something wrong in how you prayed. Are we understanding this? There's something wrong in how you pray if, if you receive gifts but not the giver. There's something wrong with your prayer. Now, the, 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 the uh, statement says that prayer does not bring God down to us, but it brings us up to God. That means every time you pray, something actually happens. You are closer to God after you pray than before you prayed. You may pray a thousand times for a job, but the more you pray, you are closer to God and, and something is happening. You may not see it. Your friends may not see it. Your pastor, your church friends may not see it, but God can see it. He sees you closer to him and, and he's pleased with what he sees. Every time you kneel, every time you pray to God, prayer changes you. It, 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 uh, it grows our hearts. It, it, it makes us able to love God. It softens our hearts to the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what prayer does. Now, in our closing hymn today, as we close, the, type, the title of the closing hymn is our Sweet Hour of Prayer. We know the song. But the goal I had this morning was to encourage all of us to pray. That was the goal. If you lack wisdom, pray. If you are confused, pray. If you are hurting, pray. If you are sick, pray. If you have dreams and ambitions, pray. Pray. In the morning when you wake up, pray. In, be in the spirit of prayer all day long. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. Now, the last stanza of the song we will sing right now. Um, sweet hour of prayer. It says, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. It says, may I your consolations share till on Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight in my immortal flesh I will rise, it says, and then and shout as I pass through the sky. Farewell, 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 sweet hour of prayer. And brothers and sisters, until then, we must pray. May God bless you. Jesus, we come before your throne again this afternoon. We are grateful for the privilege of prayer. We learned, among other things, that it is designed to help us to have a relationship with you. And may we have that relationship as we, as we leave this place. May we go home and cogitate on these things and, and seek to pray differently from now on. Fill us with your spirit and bless us and dismiss us in peace and love and grace. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.